We have to understand that the American and Israeli threats against Iran are defensive. What I mean by that is that they, is that they are attempting to, well they say they're attempting to stop the transfer of nuclear, the nuclear industry from its current locations around Iran to where its new location, which is going to be under a granite, granite mountain. So the, the, uh, this talk of war is essentially an attempt to, to do some kind of military strike on this equipment as it's moving. Because once it moves into underneath this granite mountain, then even a nuclear bomb won't get to it. This, isn't, this is defensive. They are, it's Iran that is setting the, the pattern on this. And actually when, when people talk about Iran as if, the, as if the US are doing to Iran what they did in Iraq, you have to understand that in Iraq, they already fought one war with them. Iraq had already fought a terrible war with Iran before that. Then they fought a war with the coalition of the willing in the 1990s. And, the, and there was 20 years of sanctions between then and the Americans invading. And at this point, Iraq, Iraq had gone from one of the most advanced Arab countries to one of the, one of the weakest. They look at Iran, there it is terrifying for them. Because actually, the Iranian industry is moving much, much faster. The nuclear, I don't believe, it, I don't think it has to do with nuclear bombs, I'll be honest with you. I'll tell you what it has to do with, it has to do with what they call depleted uranium. One of the uh, products of the nuclear industry is something called DU, which you place over your shells. If you place that over your shells, then there's no tank that will stand in your way. So essentially, for them to use this nuclear technology, isn't so much about whether they'll fire a nuclear warhead at Tel Aviv, I really hope they don't, because Beirut's just up the road. <laughs> but, but, but that they will use this technology to equal out. It will, it will basically mean all these Israeli tanks are useless, most of the American tanks are useless. So the kind of stuff they fired at the Iraqis, now the Iranians are about to get, this is I think part of the fear about, it's not simply about nuclear weapons, it's about all the other things that, 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 that come out from it. There's another thing I think that terrified from Iran, that if they do go or they threaten Iran, that's why the American senior brass have gone to Israel and said, don't you bloody dare. Because most of the world's oil passes through something called the Shuttle Arab Waterway. People have already heard of it. And people know it's 24 miles across. So from the tip of Iran to the tip of Oman, it's 24 miles, in which inside this 24 miles is a two-mile shipping lane. In, during the Gulf War, uh, you know, in the, in the first Gulf War, they call it, or the Iran-Iraq War, the Iranians sunk 250 or damaged 250 oil tankers. Mm -hmm. The mere idea that they all, the Iranians can do this again terrifies the hell, especially in the economic situation we are now. So everything about what they're doing and threatening against Iran is to do with being defensive rather than being offensive, as they were. With Iraq, Invaded, they didn't invade, really. It was a choice for them. Was, Iraq wasn't going to produce nuclear weapons. And Iraq couldn't do anything. It was so weak. And so for them, it was just simply what they call grabbing the low-lying fruit. Iran is a completely different kettle of fish. It's not Iraq in that sense. And there's much harder, much harder task. Not only that, but what the Iranians have done is keep the western side of Afghanistan quiet. The Shia areas of Afghanistan have been quiet. So actually, for the Americans to of the Iranians means not simply losing the Sunni areas and the tribal areas in the south and the west and, uh, and the east and so on of Afghanistan, but actually triggering an uprising, which the Iranians can quite happily do, really, they can, they, they can feed, to actually that the Americans now no longer simply face the Taliban and the Pashtun tribes, but now we're facing the Shia as well. So they're petrified. They're also petrified because of their grip, even though it's very weak, the side of Iraq, it's actually the Iraqi government is one that is extraordinarily friendly to Iran. So from everywhere they look at it, they're in an extraordinarily weak position. This, this is why, you know, you know, people talk about George Bush being a complete idiot. But I mean, he is. That's the truth. Because you, because you went into a country which was pretty much on its knees, and the real, and the and your actions were to simply give it to your biggest rival. So the biggest power control inside of Iraq, of course, is Iran. They call the shots. The government is Shia. Muqtada al-Sadr's powerful militia is under the control pretty much of the Iranian foreign policy, so they can do whatever they want. So they're absolutely petrified of massive. So, so the Israelis are terrified of what of the, the massive advances made in, in te Iranian technology. They're trying to, they have a small window, they call it a small window of opportunity in which they can try and target these things before they shift them under the, the, the mountain in Koms, and the Americans are petrified about it. So this is not a strong position. They're an extraordinarily weak position. So you see these bellicose stuff. And I think what we can miss in that, I think, is the more fundamental stuff, which is the underneath this 
chapter of war is, I think, the more significant thing, which is the, up, the upping of the sanctions regime. The sanctions regime, I think, is much more dangerous. And people talk about war and not about sanctions. And if people take your minds back to pre-Iraq war, people took, we really took apart the sanctions, what they're doing, how they're affecting. No one's talking about the sanctions and how it's affecting Iranian society, or Syrian society, for that matter. How it's affecting that. And, I, and I think we need to shift back to actually talk about this stuff um, um, much more. So it's, it's defensive. Now, of course, the thing about these things is that it's like, you know, a kid playing with matches in a petrol station because, you know, at any one point, someone could do something stupid and the whole thing kind of goes up in flames. So it isn't like it can't happen. It's just that it's not really isn't in their interest in any kind of way to, 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 to put Iran. And in fact, I think what, what's really interesting is the, um, is the, uh, I was speaking to some Iranian comrades and when the WikiLeaks did all the leaks of the American analysis of Iran, they were amazed. They were absolutely amazed because they remember the stuff coming back, coming out that they discovered in 1979 in the revolution of just being this kind of, you know, completely idiotic understanding of Iranian society. No sense of what Iranian society was, completely in the dark. And you look at what the Americans have now, they understand it very well. They understand actually the Green Movement is probably much more important than military threats. More military threats, the less the opposition has a strength. Maybe they should wait, let's hold back, let's not provoke, but that's not what the Israelis are. The Israelis are in such a terrible panic that they can trigger something. But the problem is, is that everywhere they look now, it's problems. Because the last thing you want to do is really annoy the Egyptians. And the Egyptians are in this state of revolutionary flux, so, you know, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not a nice position. I just, want to, I just want to talk a little bit, because like, one of the things that's kind of missed uh, a little bit, that's okay if I take a little bit, I'll just talk a little bit about Egypt. I think people should understand what's taking place in Egypt. There is a massive rise to working class movement that is breathtaking. So when you, I, don't, I don't even bother anymore looking at Egyptian news because there's so many strikes, so many strike waves, and so much of, of these kind of factory unions that are emerging that it's just like, you, you know, you just can't keep up with it. But I'll tell you a couple of stories. One is the foundation of the Independent Rail Workers Union to give you a sense of the revolution that's taking place in Egypt. The rail workers got together and decided they wanted an independent rail union. Fine, okay. So they had held a meeting in which just about every rail worker in Egypt turned up. So you know, there's only 5,000 of them. So they all turned up. They announced, they, they voted to form this independent union. And in the spirit of the time, they announced this union over the, uh, the, uh, over, over the tannoy system, at which, which point all the passengers said, well, we use the rail system. Why can't we join the union? Because it's our, also in our interest to join the union. <laughs> and so you have, if you like, these kind of unions that are supposed to be industry-wide unions, but actually are pulling in. So, so everyone involved, well, you know, I'd use the train. I should be part of the union. You know, it's, it's really, you start thinking, yeah, why not? Actually, think, when you think about it, why not? I thought, so, you, so you see all this kind of stuff. You also see in the Suez, the Tonistan Suez, the city of Suez, it lies at the mouth of the Suez Canal with a gate and a key. Slight exaggeration, but just to give you that sense, who controls Suez controls 5% of global trade. So you don't understand Suez not just being a little town, but actually being a town with a very, very important strategic, uh, uh, extraordinarily important uh, uh, strategic, global st uh, strategic town. The, uh, the Supreme Council of the Armed Forces, the ones who, who are now in charge in, uh, in, in, in Egypt, decided to send a couple of officers, military officers, into the Port Authority to keep an eye on what was going on there. The officers walked in. Uh, workers went, you have no right to be here without our permission. If you do not leave, we're going on strike. And the officers went, how dare you, don't you know we represent the blah. And before they can finish their sentence, a general strike across Suez, closed down all the port. <laughs> what was the reaction of the army? Well, excuse me, sorry. sorry. And, they, and they took the soldiers out. So actually, the power, when you talk about it, look at the depth and the power of the Egyptian working class, it was really, really breathtaking. It's not just in Egypt. I, know, I mentioned Kuwait, but I mean, you just look everywhere. You look in Lebanon, which is, has suffered from terrible civil war, there's a general strike next week, it's like the third, I think, in the last four months, over the price of bread. Everybody is out on strike, across the whole, from one bit of the Middle East to the other. And just to give you a sense of the Arab Spring, I went, so unfortunately I, I couldn't go to Egypt or Tunisia because I, I, I'd hurt my back. I managed to go to Lebanon to, 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 to see the comrades, and we didn't have the same, same kind of revolution everyone else. But yeah, everyone was involved in something, and they called the meeting, a behest of a constitutional lawyer, who said he, he had written this constitution, he thought everyone should hear it. Okay. I mean, you want a boring meeting, it is a boring meeting, you know. So he, he got up, about 30 people, who were the people? There were teachers, bank workers, and so on. And that was my first thing, oh, actually, this is not the usual left, you know, it's not 
you know, long hair and sort of hippie. But he's, he's, he's a worker. Oh, very interesting. Okay. So he, he starts making the speech. It's all very, very dull and so on. He finishes the speech. Hand goes up. Yeah, but you're talking about reforms. We want revolution. I was like, <laughs> anyway, to, to cut a long story short, the hotel workers next door heard there was a meeting about a revolution taking place. Actually, it was to be a meeting about a constitution. And they all walked out of the hotel, came to the meeting, not and said, are we allowed to join the meeting? Like, oh, yeah, of course, come in. <laughs> so suddenly, the hotel next door closed down. Why? So people just have a simple discussion about this one guy's idea of a constitution. This is what we mean by the Arab Spring. It is everywhere. And uh, went on a demonstration which was about women's rights. A small demonstration, middle of summer, wrong time to call it. And it was like, in the Middle East, the, the tradition is the people who organize the demonstration give you the slogans. You're not allowed to raise any other slogans. So you have to, otherwise they throw you off, they beat you off. And I know this is the tradition. Anyway, so it, it, it was a whole series of women, mainly women who couldn't get nationality for their children because they're married to Sudanese or Syrians, etc., etc. They were marching through the streets and they, and, the, and the, the person in the front chanted, what do we want, expecting people to chant back equal rights for women married to foreigners for their children, which was a slogan in Arabic, it rhymes by the way. Um, and people just shouted out, uh, revolution, revolution, we want revolution, and they're like, no, 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 this is not our slogan. And like, yes, yes, this is our slogan. And everything comes back to that. So you talk about the Arab Spring, you talk about this kind of awakening, it really is absolutely breathtaking. And you look inside of Egypt, and like Tunisia, and so on, even Morocco, which is not on the news, there's huge waves of strikes. The International Labour Organization, which deals with ports and docks, doesn't it, uh, across, so, so they coordinate trading. This is a big bureaucratic international organization. Last year, they said, they, 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 the, the head of the port, or workers, the liaison guy, said, we looked at Morocco, you, we could not find one person to represent the port workers in Morocco. This year, every single port in Morocco is unionized, and there's no problems at all finding representatives. So actually, when you think about the Arab Revolution, not somebody else the street, after this huge fundamental shift that's taking place, rise of working class organisation and, and everything that, 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 that everything that, 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 that comes with it. And of course that's really, really important because this is our social power. This is the social power of the Arab working class. And you think the Arab working class was powerful when there was a few workers and lots of peasants, now it's about everyone who's a bloody worker. And so you can really you, you really say that the other story I'll tell before I get thrown out is it, it's just the question of the, the thing about the, the hospital, which I absolutely love. Two or three days after the revolution, a central hospital in Cairo, the doctors said, oh, what are we going to do now? They've been part of the kind of build-up to the revolution and so on. They've been very, very much. Well, let's form a union. So they got together in a meeting. All, all, only doctors were allowed into the room, in which they were forming a union. The nurses heard about it. And they were just like, what are you doing? So, you know, we're forming a union. So, well, we're medical staff. We should be allowed to join this union as well. So the doctors had a discussion. Okay. Okay, we'll include the nurses. Oh, the word so the nurses are also allowed, uh, allowed to join us. And the surgery workers then heard about it. Well, if the nurses can join, why can't we bloody join? So they then barged into the meeting and said, the doctors and nurses can join the union, we'll join the union. Before you know it, the security guards and the guy who cleans the, the car park also became members of the union. <laughs> first meeting, first item on the agenda, let's form a union in this hospital. You know, unanimous. Second item on the agenda, we sacked the director immediately. And so they sacked the director from this meeting. The director appeared four or five days later as things calmed down, came to the hospital thing, was met by you know, the, 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 the doctor was a woman, a Christian woman, who she said to him, I'm afraid you have to go to the Ministry of Health and, and get your, your equivalent of P45, you've been sacked. No, you can't sack me, I'm the head of the, head of the, head of the hospital. And he called the security guards, not knowing the security guards that joined the union. The security guards says, I'm sorry, we don't need you, we'll have to escort you off the premises. So they threw him out, informed the health ministry, the health ministry sat back and said, of course, anything you want. Who do you want to be the director? They went back and elected their own director. This is just in the hospital, but it's just happening neighborhood after neighborhood. Across, and so you understand, just look under the revolution, you can literally go dizzy. You would actually go dizzy with the scale and breadth of what we call a revolution process. And it's not simply, not simply in terms of that. You look at the art, you look at the music, you look at everything, and then you look at the Muslim Brotherhood that's appeared, attempting to both hold back the revolution and represent elements of the revolution. And this, even people who vote for the Muslim Brotherhood four or five months ago are now denouncing them. And, and you know, quite openly calling for what they call the second revolution. We want the second revolution. To so, so understand this, this process is, it's so you, can, so you can imagine if you're sitting in Washington looking at that and going, how the hell do we deal with this?